We got several different stories to cover from several different outlets. It's time for another episode of the World's News Round. Let's go, guys. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is Regan Elite here with another episode of the World's News Round where I cover various stories from outside of the UK. The date and time of this is the 4th of June 2024 at exactly 10 a.m. And we start here with an article from Al Jazeera with the title La Presidenta Claudia Schilberman Winter Historic Mexico Election Mandate. The country's first female president faces a raft of challenges from crime to a fractured policy. Uh, policy? I'm going to say policy. Um, this is quite historic. This is quite a major a major breakthrough, I will say. Um, I, ju- I read a little bit of this piece before reading it. So she's a bit of an anti-establishment sort of figure. And... Uh, and the fact that we that Mexico has its first female president, I think it's, it's a great achievement in and of itself, just on that. Um, whether she can uh, do something about the wider... The, there's so much corruption within Mexico. It's, it's, well, can she do anything to, to, to decipher and untangle any of the corruption within Mexico? It's, it's very going to be very hard for her to do so. It's going to be incredibly challenging. Um, many, many, in many in careers and politicians and whatnot they're coming with the with the right with saying the right things and wanting to speak the right by speak with the good intentions of wanting to change change the country to change their to change their homeland for the better and they just find it is just too untangled too untwined and too difficult to change these things um whether or not she will be able to d- deliver the change that is needed will be a great deal of questions that is for sure um but like i said uh, at the start of the year, guys, that this was going to be a fascinating election year. And once again, we have another um, another shift in the world here in Mexico with a brand new president and the first female one of that. Um, and it's going to be very fascinating to see how Mexico does under her reign. So let's read a little bit into this. So, <clears throat> and by the way, I'm going to mispronounce people's names, so I apologize in advance. So Mexico has elected Claudia Schimmerman, a former mayor of the the capital as the country's first female president after a heated election on Sunday with the nation's top election authority projected a comfortable win for the 61 year old uh, physicist told turned politician. So she's 61 years old. This is her first time as well going into politics. And yeah, so she's got a wealth of experience behind her. 61 years old, not as old as some other, uh, I would say some other world leaders. Um, but that wealth of knowledge, knowledge uh, of of uh, for her may actually benefit her as the first female leader. Uh, Shidabum, a protege of Mexico's outgoing president Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, is, is expected to win more than 58% of the national vote. The Electoral Electoral Institute of Mexico (INE) said what is known as a quick count of the vote. With her her win entrenches the government's motorous party's hold over the power in Mexico. Six years after Lopez Umbra, also known by his initials, Almo, ran an anti-establishment campaign against the country's traditional mainstream parties to win in 2018, uh, the 2018 election. I commit to you that I will not let you down, Shinobam said in a victory statement on X. There is history, there is homeland, there is people, there is commitment. Late on Sunday night in Mexico, the principal opposition candidate, um, Xavi Galvez, conceded defeat. A trained engineer with Indonesian roots, Galvez roamed from poverty to become a tech entrepreneur. A few minutes ago, I contacted her to acknowledge the election results. I told her that I saw that I saw in Mexico with a lot of pain and violence, and I hope she can resolve the serious problems of our people. She was quoted as saying uh, by local media. During her campaign, Shidabun faced questions over her close ties to AMLO, a president who enjoys vast popularity in Mexico, despite critics accusing him of a foreign tendencies including whether she will be able to lead independently. However, Shilabum and Lopez Ombra have insisted they, they will hold no influence over her government. 
I'm going to retire completely, he said last year. I will never again appear at any public event. I do not want to be anybody's advisor. I do want to, do not want to have any relationship with politicians, the president said, adding, I'm not going to talk about politics. So he's essentially going to, dis he basically saying, he's saying this, that he's going, he's done with politics. He's done uh, in all of this and he just wants completely out of this. But can we take that at face value? That's the thing. I, I don't know if you could take that at face value. So Shudabum struggled uh, to establish her identity in, his camp in this campaign while under Alamo's influence. While trying to convince Mexicans to vote for her, she has adherently close to his, uh, to his politics while also trying to assert her individuality. To many, Mexico's first female president remains somewhat a mystery. It's complicated. Juan Pablo Mosquez, an associate professor at the Political Science of Mexico's Autonomous Institute of Technology, the ITAN, told Al Jazeera. Her political trajectory has been practically in unconditional alignment with Almo, so it's really hard for me to understand what Claudia is going to do on one or do on day one without uh, Alamo in charge, Mr. Ritzi added. However, there may be some clues in her early life suggest other analysis. So she grew up in a family deeply engaged in activism, and her involvement began at a young age at 15 years old, where she volunteered to assist groups of mothers searching for their missing children. While in the 1980s, she also joined protesters against the state intervention in education politics. She earned her PhD in energy engineering at the age of 33 as she prepared her thesis. She spent time at the Cal University of California, basically in the United States. Her political journey started in 2000 when Lopez Omar was then the newly elected mayor of Mexico City, selected her to serve as the leader of his environment mental team. In the years that followed, she actively campaigned for Almo and developed her own academic and political career, including serving as the mayor of Talpen and then Mexico City. I believe we can anticipate a presidency under Shudabam in a that is more disciplined than Lopez, a Carlos Ramirez, a political analysis at Integralia, a Mexico City-based consultancy told Al Jazeera. A more orderly presidency, a presidency with more planning, with more technical profile among the officials who will surely accommodate her surroundings in her cabinet. Ramirez says she expects Shubham, uh, Shidabam to be a president who better understands the world, unlike Lopez, whose vision has always been very provisional, very local. Nonetheless, she assumes leadership of a nation confronting a range of challenges with security issues at the forefront. In recent years, Mexico has seen more than 30,000 murders a year and some 100,000 people still unaccounted for. That's 30,000 murders a year. We know that Mexico has a really horrible death rate. And that's, by the way, that's, that's what they accounted for. So some obviously they don't get accounted at all, to be fair. Um, losing over 100,000 people, that's just incredibly scary. Um, <clears throat> it does obviously paint a different kind of image to people outside of Mexico, what kind of country that it is. We know obviously they, there are there is deep corruption within especially like the likes of drug cartels and whatnot. I don't know if she's planning to do anything, what plans she has or anything to do with to do with, against them, if anything at all. Um, but it is a problem that nonetheless. And we know, obviously, I covered this in a short video, in the build-up to these elections, there was lots and lots and lots of uh, attacks on, on, on people as well. It was very violent in the build-up to, to this to the result as well. <coughs> the lead-up to Julun, the second election, was expect exceptionally violent, with 37 candidates killed and hundreds forced to withdraw from the race. Yeah, yeah th this was extremely violent, this was. According to the annual public survey conducted by the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, the INEGI, uh, 6 out of 10 Mexican citizens rate insecurity as their primary concern. However, during Shilabam's time as Mexico City Mayor, Mayor according to Retro's report, the homicide rate fell 50% between December 2018 and June 2023. She credited this to successful security measures which enhanced police operations and collaboration with prosecutors. At the federal level, Shidabam had expressed her intention to continue Almo's strategy of avoiding confrontation with crime, crime groups, while also relying on National Guard, which is operated by the military for security operations. They will continue using the army because Nava institution has the strength to face potential problems associated with the cartel or organized crime groups. Uh, Manuel Angel Torres Rios, a dean of School of Social Science and Government of Technological Democracy at the Monetary Base University, told Al Jazeera. It is a matter of state capacity, and Mexico does not have the state capacity without the army to face these kind of problems, he added. Yeah.
he, he she's gonna have to deal with the cartels uh, i feel like she's gonna she's uh, or she either face the cartels or she'll probably just ignore them um but yeah there was a great deal of fence sense of of insecurity within mexico from from this piece but i also think it's also a possibility of renewed hope that they have someone different that they have their first female president it gives it gives people what desperately people need is hope and optimism and i hope there yeah, that she does bring that hope and optimism with her actions with her plans as mexico's president and it's no doubt going to be a very difficult challenge for her um it is going to be a very difficult challenge indeed i hope that she she brings stability um a stability good economic growth and um hopefully can do something to bring down and i know she can't outright uh, to uh, bring down the corruption i know it's not possible the drug cartels and whatnot i don't think she can outright do that but yeah i do think she can take steps m take steps in the right direction uh for the country if possible but whether she will or not obviously time will tell but congratulations to her and uh obviously i will try to post whatever shorts i possibly can on mexico and cover whenever i possibly can on it but um it will certainly be one to keep an eye out of uh, that is for sure guys but um interesting an inter interesting election to say the least there a very interesting one indeed although my heart goes out to all the candidates who died anyone who suffered in in the build up to that to that to that running because i think it was absolutely disgusting that people were treated uh treated like that simply because they want to fight for uh, to change their country for the better and those who just want to keep things as they are. It's, it's a pretty concerning to say the least. <laughs> Moving on. <clears throat> Moving on, guys, is the uh, next piece here is from Euro News. Um, so we, uh, I've covered this in a short story before, but I just wanted to kind of uh, emphasize it once again that Georgia's parliament speaker approves the controversial Russian law amidst the protests. So this is pretty much where it's signed, sealed, and delivered pretty much the Russian law that is going to be inputted in Georgia's parliament. What does this mean now? Well, it means um, it means that um, uh, Georgia is going down the path of Russia. Um, and it means its people are being, uh, you know, its, its, its journey of going into the European Union is, is, is going to be looking very bleak. And its ties to Russia are going to remain stronger than ever. Um, I feel that it, that's I, I fear the direction is coming now that this law has come through. Um, it's a sad state of affairs for Georgia uh, because it's not what the public wanted um, in any way, shape or form. The president tried to stop it and, and in the end she couldn't. Georgia's foreign agent bill sparked sparking protests and, pres and a presidential veto over concerns for, for media freedom and EU membership aspirations is defeated by the ruling Georgian Dream Party, but still faces calls for abandonment from the EU and US. Okay, so it's not completely out yet. Uh, the Georgian Speaker of the Parliament, Sheba Pashkarisky, signed the contentious foreign agent bill into law on Monday. Okay, it's in, it's in law now, sorry. Sparking significant opposition and weeks of protest from critics who argue it threatens media freedom and jeopardizes Georgia's European Union aspirations. Pilariski's endorsement following the ruling of Georgia's party of Georgia's uh, of the ruling Georgian uh, Dream Party repeal President Somolovsky Fuski's veto in a parliamentary vote on last Tuesday. The legislation mandates that media outlets, NGOs, and other non-profit entities must register as pursuits in the interest of a foreign power if over 20% of their funding originates from abroad. President Zalariski, increasingly at odds with the governing party, had vetoed the bill, accusing it of endangering the nation's future and obstructing Georgia's path towards becoming part of a free and democratic world. The government defends the law as necessary to curb the influence of harmful foreign actors allegedly seeking to destabilize the southern caucus nation of 3.7 million people nonsense i call this complete and total bs numerous georgian uh, journalists and activists contest that the bill true's aim is to stimu stimulate and restrict critical voices ahead of the parliamentary election schedule for october and that's exactly what it's going to do it's going to suppress it's going to suppress people that is what it's going to do um and whether on and um yeah, it, this is where those parliamentary elections scheduled in October are going to be really significant. But um, the damage is done now. Opponents have decreed that legislation as the Russian law likens to measures enforced by the Kremlin to suppress independent media. Excuse me, independent media, non-profits and activists. Critics suggest that the bill might be influenced by Rosh, by Moscow to hinder Georgia's further integration with the EU and the West. The Prime Minister Kerry Kamarovsky dismissed 
dismiss these criticisms, calling them unnecessary emotions that only had an artificial basis. He urged pragmatism and calm following the law enacted. Well, you didn't listen to the people, did you? The opposition United Nations movement report over the weekend that masked men attacked its central offices in Tbilisi causing significant damage. The alleged attackers had tried had ties to the ruling party, prompting the interior minister to launch an investigation into the property damage. This legislation mirrors a previous bill that was withdrawn last year following massive street protests, where new demonstrations erupted as the bill advanced through Parliament this time, leading to clashes with police who deployed tear gas and water cannons. After signing the bill, Prushki reiterated his intent to increase the resistance of Georgia's political, economic and social systems to external interference. He asserted that NGOs and media must adhere to transparency standards if they wish to influence Georgian life with foreign funding. Georgia's Civil Society Foundation announced plans to challenge the legislation in the Constitutional Court. The European Union foreign policy arm has stated that the law's adoption negatively impacts Georgia's EU progress. In response to the parliamentary approval, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken declares travel sanctions to Georgian officials deemed responsible, uh, responsible for undermining democracy. He expressed hope that the Georgian government will reverse this, its course to align with its democratic and pro-Atlantic aspirations. Opposition party UNM have condemned the bill as part of Georgia's dream efforts to align the party with Russia's sphere of influence, allegations the ruling party vehemently denies. Jordan's dream, founded by billionaire and former PM Briska Asukovsky, has faced scrutiny due to his fortune amassed in Russia. Georgia's relation with Russia has been at turbulence since its independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, and in 2008 a brief war with Russia led to Moscow recognising the separatist region of South Ossetia and Atakarska as independent states, though most of the world considers them part of Georgia. Diplomatic ties between Tbilisi and Moscow remain uh, severed, with the region's status continued to strain uh, despite recent improvements. Yeah, everyone's condemning it, and everyone says it's wrong, but it's already done. It's already been put through now, and um, yeah, it's it's a step in the wrong direction for 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 its people. I generally hope that some. I, I, my hope is that perhaps at some point they can turn this around, but. I'm not very optimistic of it. I think that because of the people in power, they have too much influence and money does influence public. And it just takes a well-oiled propaganda machine to change people's minds. And they will push out more foreign influence with this bill. Now it will be even harder uh, for medias and whatnot. It'll, be, it'll become difficult for people outside of Georgia to, be, to help those within it now. That is my generally fear that the direction that is going, and I am concerned. Obviously, um, I don't think Georgia will ever join the EU uh, while this bill is intact. Um, this bill needs to go if they ever want to rejoin the European Union. Um, but I think they're going down. They're going. To, their ties are going to get closer to Russia as opposed to the West. I'm afraid, uh, against the will of the people there. But it's down for them to cut when it comes to elections and uh, overriding the the certain media outlets certain media outlets and propaganda that come from their gov from the government and its ruling party it's down to the public to be able to to see through that and while these protests show that they are against it is the whole country united in against it is another question and that is the question really isn't it so guys, while you're here, make sure you, if you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. And share it across social media so others are notified of this video. And subscribe because it really does help support the channel. It doesn't just support me and the work that I do here, guys. It supports this whole gang here. It supports Ollie, supports Pingu and Cash Dummy and the Lava Lamp and the Orb in all of its glory. So doing that really does make a massive difference so thank you to everyone anyone who's done any of those things it is greatly appreciated so if you want to support me in non-financial ways those are the best ways to do it hitting the like button sharing across social media subscribing reading watching my videos a bit longer than necessary on leaving a comment down below all those things make a massive difference so if you've done any of them guys thank you very much it really does make a difference so this next one guys is from the associated press this is uh, back in america I actually have two American stories, but I'm going to come back to another American one later. So Biden prepares uh, an order that would shut down asylum if a daily average of 2,500 migrants survive. So this is Joe Biden's appeal to those who are obviously quite big on the whole issue around immigration. This is his way of trying to appeal to those 
voters, especially in the southern states, uh, Texas in particular, who have borders on Mexico and um, where many Mexica, Me Mexica, not just Mexicans, but uh, other nations coming from the Central America and South America who are, who are fleeing war, whatever kind of, of mitigation, whatever it is, to try and come to America for a better prosperous of life. Obviously, he needs to. He wants to show. Uh, he's trying to appeal to a certain section of audience in America that he can be tough on immigration, that he can do make a difference down there. Whether he will or not is obviously another thing. But it's because it's hard because migration is such a massive issue now in the world, and it's highlighted very well, uh, highlighted uh, very much by mainstream media's. Um, this is Biden probably looking at a way to try and appeal to those voters who who are who who are. I wouldn't say diehard Trump supporters, but probably not 100% sure, but want something done about the migrant border crossing uh, down there. So that's just probably his way of trying to appeal to them. So the White House is telling lawmakers that President Joe Biden is preparing to sign off an executive order that will shut down asylum requests at the US-Mexico border once the average number of daily encounters hit 2,500. Between the port of entry with the border reopening, only once that number declines to 1,500, according to several people familiar with the discussions. The impact of the 2,500 figure means that the executive order could go into immediate effect because daily figures are higher than that now. The Democratic president is expected to unveil the actions, his most aggressive unilateral move yet to control the number at the border, at the White House on Tuesday uh, at an evening which uh, border mayors have been invited to. Five people familiar with the discussion on Monday confirmed the 2,500 figure, while two of the people confirmed the 1,500 figure uh, number. Figures are a daily average over the course of the week. All the people insist on on Tom Lee to discuss the executive order that is not yet public. Yeah, so they've had obviously spoken to people off the record on 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 this association press. While other border activities such as trade is expected to continue, the 1,500 threshold at which the country would reopen for asylum seekers could be hard to reach. The last time the daily average dipped to 1,500 encounters was in July 2020, at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Senior White House officials, including Chief of Staff Jeff Zenins and Legislative Affairs Director Shani Goff, have been informing lawmakers on Capitol Hill of details of a plan of a planned order ahead of the formal rollout Tuesday. But several questions remain about how the executive order would work, particularly on how much cooperation the US would need for Mexican officials to carry out the executive order. The president has been deliberating for months over how to act on his own on his own after bipartisan legislation to clamp down on the silent borders collapsed because Republicans defect, defeated uh, defeated the pre uh, from the deal in massa at the urging of Donald Trump. The former president and presumptive Republican presidential nominee, Biden continued to consider executive action even though a number of illegal crossings at the southern border have declined for months, partly because of a step-up effort by Mexico. Yeah, so even though Mexico has obviously been building up its, um, has its election things, you know, America obviously and the Mexico cooperation is really, really vital along that border. And I, I and I don't know if, if um, I'm assuming that there are subsidies from America to Mexico to, for them to do their part on it. And I think Mexico has played a, a significant role in the, in helping keep the numbers down there. So I imagine a bit of money has been thrown at Mexico's border and Mexico's way to do more about that. Biden's administration officials have waited until after Mexico's presidential elections held Sunday to uh, to move on to the U.S. border actions. Mexico elected Clara Shibigan, the nation's first female leader, and Biden said in a statement on Monday that he was committed to advancing the values and interests of both our nations to the benefits of the people. The two spoke on the, mo on the phone Monday, although White House Press Secretary Carolyn Jean Perez declined to say what they spoke about the pending order. We continue to look at all the options on the table, Jean Perry told reporters travelling with Biden on Air Force One on Monday evening. The executive order will allow Biden to declare that he has uh, pushed the boundaries of his own power after lawmakers, specifically congressional Republicans, killed off what would have been the toughest border asylum uh, restriction in some time. Biden's order is aimed at trying to head off any potential spike in border encounters that could happen this year, closer to November elections. For Biden's executive order, the White House is adopting some policies directly from the bipartisan Senate border bill including the idea of limiting asylum requests once they encounter, once those encounters hit a certain number. The administration wants to encourage migrants to seek asylum at ports of entry by using U.S. Customs and Border Protection CBP, one act which schedules about 1,450 appointments per day. Administration lawyers have been planning to tap executive powers into outlined in Section 212 of the Immigration Neutrality and Nationality Act, sorry, 
which gives the presidential board authority to block entry on certain immigrants into the US if it's deemed detrimental to the national interest. It is the same rationale used by Trump to take some of his toughest actions on migration as president. If you hear a cat meowing in the background, it's don't worry. Jasper is totally fine. She's got plenty of food. She's just looking for attention. Don't worry about it. That has advocacy groups that are already preparing to challenge Biden's immigration order in court. We will need to review the executive order before making final litigation decisions, said Lee Gelligan, an attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union, who led several of the most high-profile challenges to Trump's border policy. But a policy that effectively shuts down asylum would raise clear legal problems, just as it did when the Trump administration tried to end asylum. The White House is also sure to encounter vocal resistance from many Democrat lawmakers. California Senator Alex Palaria, an outspoken critic of the Senate's earlier border bill, said the pending executive order was just not the solution we need and it's very incomplete as a strategy. So there are obviously those within the Democratic Party, obviously, who don't approve of thinking that the we shouldn't be so tough on immigrants and migrants and i i agree that that they, at the end of the day these are people who just want help and want a better opportunity a better way of life and um that that's kind of the position that, that they are taking and i understand that position especially from my point of view here in the uk when it comes to immigration here Badilia, who also briefly also briefed by the white house on the proposal wants an approach that works with countries throughout Latin America to address the poverty and unrest which drives migration to the United States. Now, this sounds good on paper. I like I like this sounds good on paper here. I like this because one of the issues I've always said about you know, migration and immigration uh, anywhere in the world is that if you want to, to reduce the migration, stop people actually coming to those borders in the first place, you need to you need to look at the countries and nations that they come from. And what are we doing? And what are you as a nation doing? What is your part doing to help with these nations to ensure that these people don't have to come to them? Um, yeah, poverty and unrest. There's there's lots of things taking place in some of the Latin American countries and South American countries that have many major issues. And America needs to do more to ensure that these countries are looking after its people, applying pressures, sanctions and whatnot to ensure that these people do not need to travel and migrate to America. In recent weeks, Palida has also pressed the White House for executive action that benefits immigrants and says the message he has heard is we're working on it. Well, yeah, that's all they can say. Biden will unveil his executive order flanked by several border mayors whom the White House invited for the announcement. Texas Mayor John Crowdon of Brownsville and Ramiro Gauzes of Edinburgh both confirmed their invitations. And San Diego's Mayor Todd Gorsuch's office also said the White House invited the mayor, but he could not attend due to scheduling difficulties. Republican Henry Carla, a Texan, a Texas Democrat who said he was briefed on the plan, said he wishes the White House would have taken executive action a long time ago and said cooperation from Mexico would continue to be as critical as the administration implements the order. If you're going to think about logistics, where else can they go, he said. They're not going to let them in, so where do they go? Do they return them to Mexico? Do they try to deport as many as they can? We we did add a lot of money to the I. CE, that's the US Immigration and Customs Forming, so they can deport. But the but the easiest thing of course is to just send them back to Mexico. You've got a lot of help of Mexico to make it work make this work. Jennifer Barbara, an attorney of Las Americas Immigration Advocacy Center in El Paso, Texas. She said she would be alarmed if Biden issued formal deportation orders without an opportunity to seek asylum. Advocates worry that he may attempt that under the two one two provision. Pandemic era expulsion authorities known as Title 42 has had a silver lining for migrants because they could try again without fearing legal consequences, Badabar said. But a formal de deportation order would expose them to felony prosecutions if they attempt again and would impose bars on illegally entering the country in the future. This is even more extreme than Title 42 while still, people, still putting people in harm's way, Barbara has said. This is uh, again like for me like they're saying that the, the 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 immigration is down apparently according to reports, but he's trying to appeal to a, a certain section of, of of a certain section of American of voters on this, um, which those who are those who are consistently fed fed about the immigration issues within America, the the consistency on their border and that not enough is being done. This is a, this is the what the number people are being told this 
And that's entirely possible that the numbers could be different and they could be much higher than what than what the Association Press reported. I don't know the 100% of what figures off the top. What I do know is that Republicans are much harsher, will be a lot harder, a lot harsher and a lot stronger on, on migration, I think, than Democrats and Joe Biden would be. That's general consensus. Do I think it's right that they can be quite cruel and inhumane to migrants and asylum seekers? No, I'm not. I don't think it's right that they should be so cruel to them. Um, I think everyone should be given an opportunity to pr to prove themselves. But I think this is one of one of President Joe Biden is obviously just looking at this and calculating this as if I do this, this may appeal to to certain voters, and it will pay appeal to some who are sitting on the fence as well, maybe as well. But um, yeah, he needs to do. The America needs to do more cooperation with the Central countries, with uh, Latin American countries, with South American countries. Those who the most that's where most of the migrants are obviously coming from, from these nations, from these con parts of the continents, a part of the world coming into America. So they do need to look at ways that they can tackle that. Um, so uh, yeah, at the moment they 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 are throwing a lot of money at the issue as well. But this executive order obviously could could have repercussions as well. But we will keep an eye on it and uh, as much as I possibly can for you guys. So guys, we are just hitting the halfway point here. We've still got quite a few uh, a video, uh, quite a few articles to go through. Um, I've got a funny video for you guys just to kind of break things up a little bit for you. So I hope you guys enjoy this one. This one is from Foil and Arms and it's titled How to Get People Back into the Cinema. And it's true because a lot of people read, uh, watch things now online and whatnot. So how do we do it, guys? How do we get people back into the cinema? We've tried remakes, sequels, prequels, crossover. Nothing is working. We are dying here. We need to find a way to get the younger generation off their phones and back into the cinema. What if we made the cinema screens vertical? Look into the infrastructural costs. Yeah, we get the actors to film the movies themselves on their iPhones. The union are going to kick up a fuss, but I like it. What about instead of one movie that goes on for three hours? Too long. What about 180 60 second movies back to back? Yes, I love it. Vegan popcorn. Vegan popcorn. Isn't popcorn already vegan. Make it more vegan and, and put up a sign. We've had 2D, we've had 3D. Yes. Well, how about. Another Marvel movie. I was hoping you'd say that. But what if it's simpler than all that? What, what do you mean? What if we just change the titles? Change the titles? We have been looking into YouTube, Instagram and TikTok in this regard. We're just going to rename our movies. Forget Shawshank Redemption. Well, that's confusing. No one knows what a Shawshank is. Yeah, instead, what about Innocent Man Escapes Prison? Shocking. Yeah. Or Accountant, Schools, Police Officer. Okay. Or my personal favourite, watch this guy crawl through two miles of human faeces. Sweet Lord. What would you prefer to watch? Aquaman or... Man holds his breath underwater for insane amount of time. The second one. Would you rather see Kill Bill or Absolute Karen just will not stop? That one. Oppenheimer becomes this nerdy scientist is crazy hot. Way better. And Saw becomes this one DIY trick will save your life. Yes. yes. Instead of Rocky 8, we should have Rocky v Creed Full Fight HD link in description. This is going to save us. Well, we're waiting for that to be actioned. I want you to increase the price of cinema tickets, increase the price of popcorn, and increase the amount of ads shown before the movies. Yes, sir. The young people are going to come running back. Doom da. But are they going to come back? <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not a fan of some of those film titles, if I'm honest. But uh, yeah, one thing I don't like about cinemas, I like there's a there's a local cinema not too far from where I live. It's actually we could actually walk to it, me and my partner. We haven't been to the cinema in a long time, but the last time we did, guys, one thing that really infuriated me compared to the last time I went to the cinema, as in the past, was just how much advertisement they throw in your face. Like, they literally make you, like, I really hate that they make you sit there, right? They make you put on adverts like you would normally watch adverts on TV. They make you go through that. Then they show you lots of trailer, film trailers. Then they show you stuff from the, the local cinema itself. And then, after all that, then you finally get to watch the film. Like, they really drag. They really drag it out before you get to watch the film. I hate that. Like, the only f advertisement I will watch is film trailers. Everything else is like, can you just get on with the film? Like, I'm not here to, to, to be... And, like, this is really, like, tries to shove it, ram it down your throat. 
And people don't want it shoved down their throats. And that's a, that's another thing I think why people get put off as well from going to cinema. All that advertisement thrown in your face before you get to watch the film. It's very annoying. It can be very, very annoying. Whereas now, if you can, you can just if you can watch it online. I know people. Some people go out of their way to find legal way, illegal ways of watching films on their screens or online before it's even in the cinema, and it just skips all of that crap. And uh, and, and on DVD or online, it skips so much of that advertisement. Like, like I, I want to support cinemas. But I'm not gonna. I'm not. I want to support cinemas, but I'm not gonna have advertisement ran down my throat. Like, I just don't want it. Like, I do. I I do miss going to the cinema. I mean, I you know it has been a while since me and my missus gone to the cinema. But I do miss going there. But I I don't want to be have advertisement ran down my throat, guys. And that that's how I feel about them here in the UK. But maybe it's different in some of your places in the world. So you let me know what you think in the comment section down below. So let's move on, guys. So the next one I've got for you here, going away from cinemas. This one is from CNA. That's the Central News, Net, uh, Central News Asia. I've covered quite a few shorts here with regards to stories and whatnot in Asia. But I just wanted to highlight this one here because I think it's really important. We will come back to um, Ukraine specifically, but this is just here. The, the headline is China has denied pressuring other countries over the Ukraine peace summit. So this month, obviously, many countries will be uh, gathering in Switzerland, I believe it is. Let me just co confirm. Uh, in Switzerland, yeah, hosted by Switzerland this month for a gathering. And Zelensky, obviously, is obviously looking to broker a bunch of countries to help uh, apply some pressure on Russia to negotiate a peace deal that would ensure that Ukraine gets its territory back of some sort. Now, uh, Ukraine are claiming that China is trying to deny um, is trying to pressure other Asian countries in talking to Ukraine about such the situation, um, which China are obviously denying. But Zelensky really wants, really wants this war to stop. He really does. He really wants Ukraine, Russia, to simply just get out of its territory and give it back to their country. But um, China, obviously, who are a staunch ally of 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 Russia. And obviously, they have their own eye on Taiwan. Obviously, over there, so they, they've 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 kind of picked their side really on this China. But I don't like this 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 idea of them pressuring other countries when it comes to this because this is really I think this is quite significant. Um, will this make a massive difference? No, but I still think it's significant for Zelensky and Ukraine. But let's read into this, guys. So China on Monday uh, denied accusations by the Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky that it was trying to prevent other nations from attending their planned peace summit over the war in Ukraine. Speaking Sunday at a security forum in Singapore, Zelensky accused Beijing of working hard today to prevent countries from coming to the peace summit due to it being hosted by Switzerland this month. Ukraine hopes the gathering will help it brand broad international backings from its version of the terms needed to end Russia's invasion. But China criticised the conference last week, saying it would be difficult for it to attend if ally Russia did not participate. Well, we know Russia aren't going to participate either way because they're not willing to get round the table to negotiate, a p to negotiate, to give up, uh, to give back the territory that is taken from Ukraine. So, Beijing's foreign ministry said on Monday that China's position is open and transparent, and there is absolutely no instance of us putting pressure on other countries. On peace talks, China's position is fair and just. It does not target any third country and, of course, is not aimed at Switzerland hosting this summit for peace, spokesperson Mia Nang said at a regular press briefing. China believes that all efforts should conclude to a peaceful resolution of the crisis should be supported, she added. Beijing insists it is a neutral party on the war in Ukraine, but has also faced sharp criticism from the West over its strategic partnership with Russia. The United States has charged, has charged that China, while not directly sending weapons to Russia, has supported Moscow's largest defense industry expansion since Soviet times. Russian President Vladimir Putin was in China last month where he sought greater Chinese backing for his war effort and signed a joint statement with China's leader Xi Jinping on deepening their country's strategic partnerships. On Sunday, Zelensky said more than 100 countries and organizations had signed up for the peace conference in Switzerland so far. After Singapore, the Ukrainian leader flew to Mala for a meeting with the Philippines' President Fernandez as he continued to push for a peace summit. 
Zelensky told Marcos that the Philippines' agreement to participate in their conference would send a very strong signal, according to a transcript of their remarks released by Mueller. Well, to be fair, yeah, Philippines obviously are going to back Ukraine because obviously China have been not exactly been friendly. As you guys know, obviously they've been pushing a lot of vessels in the South China Sea, as I've covered extensively on uh, here on the channel about some of the things that Philippines have been doing, trying uh, trying to just hold their territories while China tries to uh, boss its own territory, as well as over overstating that they own more of the South China Sea than they should. So, yeah, that's... Um, <clears throat> so I wouldn't be surprised by the Philippines uh, standing with Ukraine on this. During their meeting at the presidential palace, Zelensky also asked Marcos to send Filippo's mental health workers to help Ukrainian troops. That is something I think we are able to offer, Marcos said. Underscoring their warm ties, Zelensky said Ukraine would open an embassy in Malia this year. Oh, that's good as well. So that, that's, um, that, that's uh, so obviously to improve um, relationships there between Ukraine and the Philippines. That's a very good thing. But I also think that obviously ties into, obviously, um, China have obviously made it clear, have uh, I've said that none of their weapons and supplies are going to Russia. Now, as far as I'm aware, as still as this, now some people may deny this and say that China are sending them weapons, but there have been no reports and no indications inside the, the conflict in Russia that any weapons or, or any weapons bombs or anything that have been used by Russia has been made in China. As far as I'm aware, I've not seen any reports on that. If you have something that, that does confirm that, confirms it or has videos or video footage that confirms otherwise send me a link in the in the discord and i'll have a look at it and just tag me in it and i'll have a look whenever i get a chance to but i'm not um i'm, I'm not i'm i'm kind of a part I, a part of me feels like that china may be telling the truth and in, in terms of pressure but china may not be telling the truth in terms of pressure we know they obviously have huge uh they have a huge amount of influence on the world stage and we know that they can bully other other Asian countries so it's entirely possible that they may have pressured other countries with regards to this we don't know and um, so this could be just Zelensky just making word salad there as well um, so it is it is an interesting pos uh, position for him to go flat out accusing China there I would have I would have liked <coughs> personally and I hope China does attend I can understand if China doesn't attend because because China doesn't attend I want China to attend and I want them to seriously have a conversation with Zelensky um, I really hope so, but I don't. I don't see it happening. If I'm honest, I really hope this peace summit something good comes out of it. I really hope so, but I'm 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 holding my breath. If I'm honest, more on that. If I'm if I'm to be honest, guys, but we'll have to wait and see. So, guys, one of the ways you can support me on this channel is uh, I have a a YouTube membership. So being a YouTube member really does make a massive difference and it really does help support uh, financially support for the work that I do here. You can apply for YouTube membership for as little as 99p, but we also have a 299 membership if you want to join that as well. Just being a 99p member gets you access to custom emojis. Obviously, if you're ever in the chats and whatnot, uh, whenever I'm live streaming or in premieres, obviously, I'll give you a shout out. I can't shout you out in a premiere video because it's pre-recorded. But on live streams, obviously, if you're there, obviously, I'll give off. I'll mention you obviously on the live stream and uh, obviously um, as well if you uh, comment on any of my videos so as a YouTube member for 99p if you comment on any of my videos <coughs> I will respond back uh, to you uh, whatever video it may be as well so memberships and also get access to obviously any membership community posts that I do as well behind a bit a little bit of things as well there as well um, if you're a 299 membership, you not only you get on top of all those benefits, but you also get early access to my content as well. So anyone who's a 299 membership gets access to all these additional benefits as well. So 99p, 299 doesn't sound like a lot. It's once a month, but it really does make a massive difference. It really does support me and the work that I do here. So anyone who is a YouTube member, thank you very much for doing so. It is greatly appreciated. Obviously, any super chats are also welcomed as well. So anyone wants to uh, give any super chats, thank you very much for anyone who does any of them. It's greatly appreciated. Otherwise, you can financially support me is by buying me a coffee. Link for that is in the description if you want to buy me a coffee. And also, you could join me on Patreon as well for a certain... I get actually a bigger cut on Patreon than I do on YouTube. So, if, And not only that, you get access to exclusive content on Patreon as well. 
um, if you're a paid member. There's also free content on Patreon that's exclusive as well, as well as free content that is available on Rumble as well. You can check out them. Links for them are in the description. At the moment on Rumble, I've been covering lots of Israel and Gaza. So if you want to see a lot of stories, uh, different stories on Israel and Gaza from different perspectives and whatnot, do check out the Rumble the Rumble channel. The link for that is in the description. And thank you to everyone who has financially supported me in whatever way possible because it really does keep uh, keep the channel going. And it just uh, only endures me to, to work even more harder than ever before. So thank you to everyone who does that. It really does make a difference. Speaking of Israel and Gaza. Now, Norm, like I said just before, uh, just before, um, just before, um, just before I said that, obviously, I, I do have a piece here from from the Israel and Gaza war that I wanted to cover to you guys because I didn't want to leave out the uh, leave out YouTube followers, obviously there. But obviously, the main context uh, con content will be on Rumble. But obviously, I did want to cover at least one here. So this um, one here is an interesting piece here from CNN with the headline that Netanyahu may be forced to choose between his government survival. And a ceasefire deal, and I really think this this um it the the clock is ticking on Netanyahu. So as I've covered, excuse me. Apologies, as I've covered uh, various stories on Rumble, um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, um, he's he's the time the clock is really ticking on him and his government. We know that 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 as soon as this war is over, a lot. Of of Israeli citizens want a election. They want to kick him out and they want to elect someone new. They feel that he has not done enough, that he is responsible for not doing more when the October 7th attack happened that caused so many lives to be lost for those for the Israelis to be kidnapped and are still being held captive, some of them as well. Um, for their handling of how of how they've conducted themselves with inside the Gaza Strip and also believe that he is not uh, also has damaged the representation of Israel on the grand stage as well by him and his government and uh, the way that the IDF has conducted themselves within the within there so we know that he's not in very good stead right now um, but obviously a ceasefire deal is something that everyone wants but a part of me as, as, as I will have read as I've spoken on Rumble is that uh, the reason why I don't think he will want a ceasefire deal because if he does that election will be called and he does not want that. So I, my generally belief is Netanyahu will try to stall for as much long as he possibly can. <clears throat> so let's read into this, guys. So Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu may soon force to choose agreeing to a ceasefire deal with Hamas or keep his government in power. But as he confronts that choice, Netanyahu is also looking for a way to avoid it altogether. For months, Netanyahu has gingerly balanced three complicated uh, competing imperatives by refusing to even contemplate a permanent ceasefire as he blames Hamas for delusional demands by the collapse of the previous round of negotiations. But after US President Joe Biden publicly outlined Israel's latest ceasefire proposal on Friday, one that could lead to a permanent truce in which Hamas may be prepared to accept Netanyahu is now out of time. I think that baby is cornered now, said Avik, uh, um, so as a former advisor to Netanyahu. Using the Prime Minister's nickname Biden, a uh, forcibly BB, Bybee uh, to take off his mask and say, OK, now is the money time. Are you in favour of this deal? He said. As Israel awaits Hamas's response to his latest proposal, National Security Minister uh, Imra ben Gaviga and other far-right members of the Netanyahu coalition are already threatening to bolt from the government and cause its collapse if the Prime Minister follows through. Amid a chorus of threats from his right flank, Netanyahu is trying to reframe the latest ceasefire proposal, insisting to ben Gavir and others what the terms of the deals are not as Biden defines them. While Biden squares frame his proposal this way to end the war, Netanyahu is insisting Israel will not win the war until Hamas is eliminated. And the thing is, you can't eliminate Hamas. I just don't see how you can eliminate Hamas. There doesn't seem to be a way for me out of this, in my opinion. Netanyahu told Kisik Foreign Affairs and Security Committee on Monday that the claim that we can agree to a ceasefire without our conditions being met is not true. He appealed to referring to the permanent ceasefire outlined in the second phase of the proposal, the conditions of which Israel and Hamas would need to negotiate during the first phase, a point Netanyahu sought to emphasize in recent days. According to Biden, the three-phase proposal would pair a release of hostages with a full and complete ceasefire. But Netanyahu's spokesperson told journalists a, mon a briefing on Monday that Biden had presented only a partial outline of the deal that Israel had offered Hamas. 
The war will be stopped for the purpose of returning hostages and then we will proceed with further discussions. There are other details that the US president did not present to the public, the spokesperson added. Spokesperson reiterated that Israel's refusal to agree to any ceasefire until all hostages have been released, until Gaza no longer poses a threat to Israel, and until Hamas government and military capabilities in Gaza have been eradicated. The notion that Israel will agree to a permanent ceasefire before these conditions are fulfilled is a non-starter. It's not an option, says the spokesperson. Netanyahu's efforts to convince the far-right ministers in order to avoid choosing between a ceasefire deal and the survival of his government have so far fallen flat. Ben Gavir said Monday that Netanyahu's office refused to follow through on commitments to show him the draft proposals, leaving him convinced the Prime Minister has something to hide. If Ben Gavir or Finance Minister Benjamin Shomak don't back off their threats and leave the government, Netanyahu will be back to the binary choice that is beginning to materialise before his eyes. Opposition leader Yala Lapik has offered to provide a safety net to keep the government in power in order to achieve a ceasefire deal. But doing so will be handing Lapid the keys to force in early election once the deal is implemented, which Netanyahu does not want. Just over it is just as it has been over the past eight months, Netanyahu's political survival may be wrapped up on the continuation of the war and his elusive pursuit of total victory over Hamas. Netanyahu is confronting a choice between his government, survival and a hostage deal at a time when his political fortunes began to improve. Yes, for the first time this year, Netanyahu edged out his chief political rivals, Benny Gavis, as his preferred choice for Prime Minister for Israelis. 36% to 30% according to a Channel 12 survey last week. Yeah, this was a demonstration on the May the 11th last month here. Uh, calling for the hostages to be released. And the smittering of recent polls has shown Gala's National Uni Party faltering, while Netanyahu's Linux is making modest gains. Okay. Interesting, that's conflicting evidence than what I've been hearing. National unity was still in a priority of seats in the Kesex, Israel's parliament, but the party's 19-seat advantage over Kulik in December has dropped to a four-seat advantage in last week's Channel 12 poll. The improvement of Netanyahu's political standing coincides with a surge of international condemnation of Israel's war effort in Gaza and the International Criminal Court's decision to seek an arrest warrant for Netanyahu, all of which has positioned Netanyahu domestically as Israeli's defender, a familiar and comfortable role for Israel's long-serving Prime Minister. Meanwhile, Ghana's threat to leave the war cabinet over Netanyahu's lack of long-term strategy in Gaza appears to be the cause of his drop in support. A poll by Israel's Channel 11 on Monday put the Israeli public support for the ceasefire deal currently at the table at 40%, with, four, with 27 opposed and 33% are unsure. But if Netanyahu is now contemplating whether there is more upside to continuing the war than reaching a ceasefire deal, Biden's speech last week didn't just force Netanyahu to confront that choice, but it was also aimed at countering the pressure Netanyahu is now facing to abandon his own government proposals. I know there are those in Israel who do not agree with this plan and will call for the war to continue indefinitely. Some are even in the government's coalition, Biden said. While I urge the leadership in Israel to stand behind this deal despite whatever pressure comes. Despite Netanyahu's remarks that the conditions for ending the war have not changed, the US State Department said on Monday it was completely confident Israel would go along with the proposed layout by Biden. The only thing standing in the way of immediate ceasefire today is Hamas, Matthew Miller told a press briefing. But one key question remains, will Hamas force Netanyahu to make the choice he now confronts, or will Yang and Sinwa, Hamas's leader in Gaza, offer Netanyahu an escape hatch of his own making? Hamas said it views Biden's, Biden's speech about the latest Israel proposal positively, but has yet to submit its official response. While these latest proposals make major concessions to close the gap of Hamas's demands, including by offering clear pathways to a permanent ceasefire, it still falls short of meeting all their demands. You can't, you can't call for an, you can't get a permanent ceasefire. You can't have a permanent ceasefire while also claiming to, you're going to outright destroy Hamas. You, you can't have both. So where is the line here? It allows the initial six-week ceasefire period to be extended for as long as possible as the parties need to negotiate a permanent truce that includes the withdrawal of Israeli troops in Gaza in the second phase of the deal. But it does not require Israel to commit to a permanent ceasefire up front. Hamas's refusal to compromise on that point and sign off on this deal could let Netanyahu off the hook and plunge Gaza into many more months of war. <sighs> there was a story I covered on Rumble, and you can check it out, about what, what how things would be if, if the war can carried on until the end of the year. Like I said, I would check out the Rumble uh, Rumble content. I've got five videos dropping over this week on it on, on Israel and Gaza. 
But uh, on this piece alone, like it is a difficult situation. Um, but I, my my concern is not what Netanyahu and Israel government are thinking. My concern is what's happening with the 36,000 plus people who have lost their lives, the 11,000 plus women and children who have lost their lives, the, continu the continuation of starvation, of bombs falling, of innocent lives dying every single day with inside that Gaza Strip. And what are we doing to ensure that their survivability, ensuring that we give them the aid and support that they desperately needed? What are we doing about them? That That's for me the, the thing that sticks out to me more than anything. And uh, part of me feels like uh, that uh, that that Israel's government and the IDF are deliberately and intentionally making it difficult for, for aid to come into those places. But on this, I want a ceasefire. Will we get a ceasefire? I don't think so. I don't think we will. I want one, but I just don't see it happening, guys. I really, really don't. So just before I go to the last stuff, guys, we're going to be looking at uh, the latest stories that are happening in the war in Ukraine. If you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. Share it across social media so others are not fire this video. And if you haven't subscribed already, please consider subscribing because all those things really do help support the channel. And thank you to everyone who has done, done so. It doesn't just support me. It supports the gang behind me. They're all doing very well. Um, none of them like Netanyahu. None of them. Ollie's not a big fan of Netanyahu. Pingu says he's not a fan um, of it of, of of Netanyahu either. Cash Dummy says it's it's inhumane what's happening to the people in within uh, within inside the Gaza Strip, and I couldn't agree more, Cash Dummy, on that. Um, but yeah, it is absolutely terrible what's happening there. As is what's happening in Ukraine as well, this conflict that has been going on, guys. So what's the latest happening in Ukraine? We're going to go look at the Kiev Independent here. The first story they have here is that Russian strikes against Kushkin on blast killed one and injured two. So another loss of life, sadly, uh, within in this conflict, guys. So Russian forces attacked the villages of Vesky and Boskoriska in Kushkin on blast on June the 4th, killing one person and injuring two. Governor Oskar Pruskin had reported... Kushka and other regional settlements in the west of the Dymo River have been subjugated to near daily Russian strikes since Ukraine liberated the area in November 2022. And Russian troops were pushed to the river's east banks. Russian troops carried out the strike in the morning, targeting the, cent the center of Balabiska, according to Prugum. A 55 year old woman who was in the building at the moment of the attack suffered a blast injury and a shrapnel wound to the stomach. She was hospitalized and in a condition of moderate severity. An 81-year-old woman was injured while she was standing in the street. She suffered a concussion and blast and head injuries. Three shops, a cafe and a car were also damaged. Another Russian strike targeted Viskin around 12.30pm local time, the governor said. An elderly woman was killed in the attack. She was in the yard of her house when the strike happened. Viskin and Boloviska lie north of the Dymo River Delta across the Russian-occupied territories of Kursk and Omblask. On the previous day, a Russian uh, attack against the village of Tomoriska Balka injured a man aged around 70, the regional administration had said there. Um, this is another one here from... Oh, we've got another attack we'll look at in just a moment. Parliament passes a law on use of English in Ukraine. So what's this one? So Ukraine's parliament passed a law on June the 4th establishing an English as a language of international communication that its lawmaker has said. The law also devised specific positions required for the knowledge of English and established protocols uh, for the uses of English in various governments and public sector officials. It also added an amendment to provide voluntary support for movie theaters to show English language films. The law passed with 236 lawmakers in support of three against the measure. The draft law was first passed in November 2023 and excludes a controversial amendment that would have ended the common practice of dubbing English language films into Ukrainian. This clause, which requires all English language films in Ukrainian cinema to be shown in English with uh, Ukrainian subtitles by 2027, became the focus of petition over the summer. Dubbing has long become a separate cultural phenomenon that contributes to the popularity of Ukrainian language in Ukraine, the petition has said. Showing, um, the showing films their original language subtitles could result in noticeable decrease in the number of viewers in cinemas, destruction of Ukraine's job in the industry and an increase in viewers watching movies on the pirate sites in Russia, the petition said. Now the clause has been removed and the draft law who advocate the preservation of jobbing can rest easy, Zanelinska said. It's an interesting piece there, say the least, that they're pushing more for the use of English law in some of its part in some of its places while this war conflict is still going on. Interesting one to say the least. So there's this one has just dropped just literally now. 
a Russian attack in Dimarai Prescott. Sumi on blast that killed him injured one as well. Russian forces launched a gap. A ca- Sorry, let me repeat myself. Russian forces launched an attack against Adama Reskitz and Sumi on blast today, killing a man and injuring another one, local reporters said. In Sumi on blast, the Russian military struck the village of Samariska Buska with artillery, killing a 70-year-old man in the yard of his house, according to local prosecutor's office. In Dima Reskitz on blast, Russian forces targeted a Rivik uh, Rai district with a missile. A 69-year-old man was injured and hospitalized, and a house was destroyed, the governor, Sergei, had reported. Russian attacks in the regional centre of Dynamo earlier in the day, injuring at least eight civilians, including a one-month-old baby and a 17-year-old boy. In recent months, uh, Russia has intensified its attack against Ukraine's critical infrastructure and population centres there. Um, Let's see what else is here. Interesting here. 43% of Ukrainians see democracy decline, 19 improve, and 29% no change, a survey has shown. So around 43% of Ukrainians think the state of democracy has worsened during this five-year tenure of President Vladimir Zelensky, with 11% linking to circumstances of wartime and 28% blaming the authorities. According to a survey by the Kiev International Institute of Sociology, the KIIS, published uh, today, some 3% of those who think the situation deteriorated blamed both the war and the authorities, while 19% of respondents think that the state of democracy has improved over the past five years, while 29% see no change. The result of the survey stands in contrast to observers by the Freedom House, which say that Ukraine is one of the few countries of the region making successful strides towards democracy. Taking into account Ukraine's historical experiences about, about how the five-year terms of previous presidents ended, the current perception is relatively good and leaves space for the president to maintain a fairly high level of support and optimism in the future. To Anto Horisky, the executive director of the KIIS. More than 90% of Ukrainians want to see their country as a fully functioning democracy, the KIIS said. Around half of the respondents, 49%, believe that the economic situation has deteriorated, with around 16.5% naming the war and 23% erroneous government policies that is the main culprit. Around 70% believe that the economic situation has improved, with while 21% think that uh, think it remains the same. Talking on the subject of ideal form of government, 16% of Ukrainians would prefer the parliamentary government, while 13% voice support for presidential reform. Interesting, um, interesting stuff to say the least. There, they don't really have. Uh, I'm just going to refresh it one more time to see if there's anything else. Nothing else too much, I think. Uh, I've covered that already. Uh, last, I'll cover this last one here. Germany plans to order an additional 200,000 artillery shells from Ritter Malto, Retorus says. Uh, Berlin intends to order artillery shells uh, from its arms manufacturer than originally planned. Is this going towards, am I assuming that these shells will go towards Ukraine? Looks like it, yeah. The newly supplied shells would help replenish German stocks in Berlin, continues to assist Kiev in defending itself against the Russian ongoing war. The German military aims to acquire 200,000 additional 155mm artillery shells worth about 800 and 880 million euros. Under the agreement with Retimental, the letter from the German Defence Ministry to Parliament Budget Committee have read. The deal being worth 1.2 billion euros and included 100,000 uh, shells, fuses and charges. By placing the order, the German Defence Ministry also wants to ensure that Romamanto can launch a new productive line in the town of Yugorescus in the central part of the country, Retoris had said. Since the all-out war in Ukraine started start in February 2022, the value of Retimental has more than quadrupled due to the growing number of orders from Kiev Western powers, according to news agencies. Previously, the company said it would also build an artillery factory in Ukraine, along with facilities dedicated to the production of military vehicles, gunpowder and anti-aircraft weapons. During the Munich uh, Security Conference in February, Retomalto CEO Armoren signed a mentobolium uh, of intent with Ukraine's strategic industry minister Alexander to produce artillery shells in another joint plant, uh, joint plant base in Ukraine. So some interesting, interesting, um, interesting things there with regards to the war. I'm just going to see if there's anything. It's not um, all eyes on Karlov. Russian troops take one Donbass region after another here. Um, a report on the general staff there. This is the day. Uh, Russia has lost 512,420 troops in the Ukraine since February 24th. 
Uh, the numbers, guys. So this is, uh, I've said this before and I've said this again. These are the closest numbers that they have to them. Are they factual? No, this is about as close as they can possibly get to these figures. So uh, Russia has lost five, uh, five, uh, 5, 520 troops in Ukraine since the full-scale invasion of 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 uh, since this full-scale invasion on February 24th, 2022, the general staff of Ukraine's armed forces have avoided on June the 4th. This number includes 1,290 casualties Russian forces suffered over the past day. According to the report, Russia has lost 7,794 tanks, 15,200 armored fighting vehicles, 18,228 vehicles and fuel tanks, 13,345 uh, artillery systems, 1,092 multiple rocket launch systems, 827 air defense systems, 357 airplanes, 326 helicopters, 10,766 drones, 27 ships and boats, and one submarine. So those are the numbers that they have uh, got there at the moment. But um, I'm just seeing uh, there um, any other things there. If we want to look at anything else there, really. Um, I think we'll leave it there for now. They report this on a daily basis, by the way, those numbers. Every day they report it. From, they report the, the, the figures. So what's been added uh, on, on terms of that. But um, as so... Before, obviously, the summit obviously is going to play. The summit this month in Switzerland is going to be very interesting to see what comes out of it, if anything, of course. There is obviously, of course, the EU elections. I don't know how much, if any, of. Um, I'm pretty sure that Ukraine will obviously be. That what's happening in Ukraine will be a factor in the EU elections as well, because of obviously how much money and support and whatnot that nations are giving to Ukraine. Because obviously that will play a factor on, on and that will have an influence on some people as well. I think this war has been difficult um, for, for Ukraine without a shadow of a doubt. And Russia have been still making gains. Um, I was tempted to bring up the deep state map, but instead I might just do a separate video. Um, I might do a separate video rather than on rather than that on the snowflake corner on on a lot more details on what's been happening in the war in Ukraine because I haven't really looked as much as it into ukraine's war recently as i should be probably because my eyes are elsewhere with a certain election here in the uk but what i will say is is that this right this war is still going at the moment nothing really is changing are we seeing and, and how much and now it's been a while now since obviously the the bill has passed in congress when it comes to the aid the military aid budget from the us to ukraine how much has that made a difference? Has it stopped the progress of, 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 of Russia in this conflict? We'll have to have to see in due course, guys. But what did you guys make of the stories we covered today? We covered quite a variety here on the World's News Round. Going, talking about Mexico's new first female president to Georgia's parliament, obviously imposing Russia's law. President Biden on his plans to drive down migration. China denying any kind of pressuring at the Ukrainian peace summit. And um, Netanyahu may be forcing to choose between his government's survival and a ceasefire deal. Let me know your thoughts about all these stories and more in the comments section down below. But just before you go, let's just see how you guys, how's the game doing here? They're all doing pretty, pretty solid. They're pretty happy. Uh, they enjoyed the show today and hopefully you guys did too. But just before you go, guys, just one more thing I need you guys to do. If you haven't already, please hit the like button. We greatly appreciate it. Share it across social media so others are not fired this video. And subscribe because it really does help support the channel. And if you want to go one step further, financially support me in the work that I do here, you could do so by becoming a YouTube member for as little as 99p. Or join me on Rumble or Patreon for exclusive content on those platforms. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope to catch you all very, very soon.